Taking her to college mm -hmm. was when Andrew hit. Mm -hmm. And that was the first big, big hurricane. But we didn't get as much force <laughs> from South, South Miami. Youngstead, they really got hit. Where she knows people Oh, upstate Florida, she went there for undergrad, and then she went to Portland State University. And we did a lot of grad school. Uh, so, and in between, she graduated from Stanford, and then that summer she did her graduation in South Dakota. She was a volunteer. No, I see. Wow. Yeah. I think if it doesn't happen, she's going to be very upset. I think it's going to happen. The Thank you. 
I shouldn't walk too, I shouldn't roam too much. Uh, how, how far could I roam? Uh, move over just for a second. You get at, move out of the way of the, uh, the camera for a second. Uh, you got the window. Yeah, but you can take the mic with you. I'll, I'll walk around. Yeah, but the windows are your, your visual limit. Hi, baby. You can zoom. You're back. You're back. I need to be back. I'm going to fix it up. I'm going to fix it up. I'm going to I 
If there are few able bodied uh, humans in the room, could you bring some chicks or chairs to the other classroom? Because we're half chairs. So if a few people feel like you can give me three or four, there more people coming and we're at the people ready.
your talk, your debar. Your... <laughs> because it's an art form, and I take pride in the art form. Form. So you can say sermon and you won't die. It's fine. Uh, it's not like the high priest going into the Holy of Holies like a before, where you're not sure what's going to happen if you say a word the wrong way, like you would hate bug head, right? It's not like you would hate bug uh, which is the Hebrew letter for God. Okay. Uh, so I, first I need to make a confession, okay? Uh, I'm like not a real Trekkie, okay? I love the series, but a Trekkie... A real trick would know who another Trekkie is. And I actually got outed last night already on the receiving line by more than one person. So if you're laughing and you think you're the only one who identified it, and I saw a couple of Trekkies today who said to me, I want to come to your talk. I said, well, if you want to be a really real Trekkie, you need to identify what one mistake I made in this sermon. Okay? And when it was identified to me, I knew I, I had blown it, but I made a mistake, okay? And the mistake was that uh, when I said that the Starship Enterprise was about to explode because of the deterioration of the lithium crystals, it was dye lithium crystals. <laughs> So I was two letters off the same day, and now my hope of being invited to be keynoting the next Trekkie convention has been dashed. I can't, I won't be able to pull it off. Okay? So it's dye lithium crystals that drive the Starship Enterprise, okay? So you got to do your homework, and I tried to, but I got that wrong. Okay. Uh, you have 45 people on Zoom. Whoa. Welcome everyone from Zoom. Okay, <laughs> you're in the wrong room, but it's okay. There are there are more than 45 people in this room, which is great. Uh, so I'm not going to you know do the sermon again, uh, but I'd love to get a talk back, which we usually have a chance to do during the year on Shabbat and in Debar Torah, just people's reaction to it, thoughts about it, and we can have a nice sharing. I'm going to pass the mic around because this is the only way that the Zoom room folks can hear. So. Any thoughts, comments, reactions? I am Harriet Chiverman. I'm Harriet Chiverman. Um, <clears throat> what I thought about immediately as you were talking was years ago when the troubles first started, when we became more aware of how polarized we were. A group called, at the time, Better Angels, and then they became Braver Angels, I think, failed because the only people who signed up to attend were people from one side. So in keeping with what your remarks were last night, I wonder if you could comment on either, was it too soon then? Was were feelings too raw? Or what do we have to do to make those efforts more successful? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great point, Harriet. And uh, uh, same that I signed up for some, several of these gatherings from Better Angels, later Braver Angels, and they got canceled because they could only get, you know, liberals, blues were coming to get, coming together, and people who were more conservative didn't want to come to those things. Uh, Could you explain what that was? To you? Well, and the, and the effort was to essentially do what my sermon suggested to try and humanize the other side. You know, so gatherings that would be facilitated in a way that would try and avoid the partisanship and get to uh, human connections. Um, and there are many such projects that got launched. I, I'm not, I can't like recount all the ones that are out there. There's still some efforts happening that are going on, some more successful than others. Um, a young woman who I met some years ago who um, started a project called The Dinner Party out of LA, which was actually dinners for people who had lost parents uh, who found they had, could find no place to have a conversation about their loss. She starts with the dinner party, which has been nationally successful all over the country. And she hooked up with another young woman who I know who uh, runs a, a, faith, a faith project out of Tennessee. And they joined together for, I forget the name of it now. They had a very successful project jointly, uh, faith-based conversations about the future of our country. And that was working well. Uh, this new project, the first speaker, if you don't, if you haven't seen the poster for Shabbat Voices, I'm going to do a quick shout out uh, in the in the lot in the foyer. There's a project that I put together for the year called Shabbat Voices. It'll be uh, six major programs from December through May, 
once a month on Shabbat morning. Uh, we're going to have a shorter Shabbat morning service and two major presentations for major people. Uh, the first one is on December 12th. You need to come to that, okay? The Aunt Aviv, who I've known for more than 30 years, uh, is works with a group called the Partnership for a Better Democracy, and they are running projects like this. And she's really at the center of the work, and she's just spun off a, another project called Our Covenant, which is all going to be faith-based. So there's both the secular conversation and the faith-based. So if you want to know more about it, Diana V is like the expert, like nationally in this. That's why we bring her, okay? Um, but I think it's important to have that humanized. And one other story I'll tell you is that I was at a conference uh, about a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, where an African-American young woman told about, she was a filmmaker. And she went back, she grew up in some place in, uh, I think it was South Carolina. And she went back to the community where she grew up. And she worked really hard to meet with people who were now known as white supremacists, white nationalists, whatever else. Now, not everyone agreed to sit with her, but some did. And she filmed it. Uh, and she made a presentation, showed excerpts from the film, whatever else, and quite remarkable because suddenly the person who you see as your arch enemy, who's going to undermine everything that you stand for and what you represent as a young black woman in America, uh, you sit face to face with them for an hour or so, it changes both individuals in a very powerful way. So it's not easily done, but we need to continue at it. Hi, I have two things to say. Um, number one, Dar from what you were just saying, Darrow Davis is a local African-American blues musician. Mm -hmm. And he has uh, recorded um, sessions where he talks about meeting with members of the Ku Klux Klan mm -hmm. and talking about the events that happened. So I'm sure that you can find that someplace on YouTube. Darrow Davis talking with members of the Ku Klux Klan. But what I really want to say is going to open a can of worms. Facebook. I love Facebook. It's a way for me to keep up with a wide group of people, people that I met on trips, people from here and there. And it's a way for me to learn about people. And I certainly recognize the downfall of it. I mean, I would never have a party and post pictures of the party because what about the people I didn't invite, you know, which you alluded to. Um, but it, and, and certainly there's a lot of political stuff there, which could be extremely nasty, but that's not what I concentrate on. I concentrate on the people I know and what they're up to. And it's just a wonderful venue for me to keep in touch. Yeah. Um... The only thing I want to say about social media like Facebook is I think that there's been a total failure on the part of Congress to impose regulations on that emerging monopoly or what do you want to call it. Uh, it is changing the face of every society on the planet, okay, and not in a healthy way. Um, you know, people I know who've been quite involved in developing the issue, whatever else, you know, have second and third thoughts about what has come of it, okay? It's kind of like a Frankenstein. So I know all the benefits of having social media, you know, Carrie, you went through an illness and people were connecting with you in that way. So there are tons of ways that social media could be helpful, but the, the way that it magnifies hatred uh, takes what was a long time, a fringe phenomenon of extremism and centering it and the obfuscation of truth where people no longer know what's true or what's false is very, very dangerous. Uh, you might have seen only about two weeks ago, there was a piece in the Post, which not to get you too scared. Uh, now what has been done in words is going to be able to be done in photos. They've now there's some kind of technology, I can't explain it, where you can, everyone knows about Photoshopping stuff and you can create a fictitious image, okay? But apparently, this the software to do it on a very high sophisticated level has been behind closed doors and now it's going open. So now you're going to get pictures saying like, you know, here's individual A with individual B and they were never together and makes an accusation about why these people were together and what happened there, whatever else. So the, the obfuscation of truth 
I think goes to the very core of how you create a healthy society. And social media has actually broken all the rules on that, and they're totally unregulated. And I think it's unsustainable for our country and for the world. Yeah. Mary. Um, so I'm sort of a chunky, I think, but when you <laughs> gave your talk yesterday, it made me naturally think of the episode where um, Adam Kirk kisses Uhura, who is a, who is a Black woman. And um, it made me think, like, in 1969 or whenever that happened, that was like, whoa, a big deal for everyone, including probably liberals. And how, like, in our community, we probably come so accustomed now to seeing interracial theater or movies or learning from our children about like gender difference. And we're so kind of accepting that like, but there's communities that are so much less diverse than ours. And like, maybe they still need aha moments like the interracial kiss, like something, and maybe that's not happening. And so bringing aha moments to help people, and I don't want to sound like we know better, because I know a little bit sounds like that, like, oh, we're so open-minded, but maybe just more ways of bringing aha moments to those communities that don't have that to help them understand the power of tolerance and acceptance is like something we should all be striving for, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Uh, you know, one of the things that I was going to say is probably the most, uh, for those of us who are who identify on the more progressive side of the political spectrum, uh, arguably the most successful so social change of the past uh, two decades was the moving for marriage equality, okay? And it's really worth interrogating how that happened. Uh, I actually remember here in a Shalom even, where early on we had some conversations about uh, our policy towards LGBT individuals, whatever else, and there were a few people, not a lot, a few people who felt uncomfortable with that, shared it with me. Uh, they weren't always comfortable sharing it openly because overall we were a progressive community. And that's another issue we need to think about, about is everyone comfortable saying what they want to say in a space? Uh, cancel culture affects every place, including a national, by the way, where things are not allowed to be said. But anyway, I found over time how this country moved towards marriage equality is that more and more people came to know someone in their circle who was gay or lesbian. And by knowing them, somehow it was no longer the demon you know, incarnate. It wasn't going to undermine our society. It wasn't going to corrupt our morals. They were just people like you and me, OK? And that, more than anything else, is what turned the country in a remarkable way and in a relatively short period of time to saying, like, why not? OK, why not? And I think that goes back to the question Harry raised at the very beginning about how can we create settings where people can get to know each other across lines of difference. You know, we still don't do that very well. Uh, and the, the case of Ahura is another example. It was a big no-no at the time, and, uh, you know, it made an impression. Uh, but Anthony, so first, I'm going to Joel behind him. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Joel Flinger's husband. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to put in a plug, Sid, for, and to everybody in the room, for media literacy. And I think because you were, that was one of your three points. And uh, what I would say is that similar to junk food and healthy food, people have to really learn about what's healthy media and what's junk media. Yeah. So I hope that's something that people can work on. I think all of us have to work on it. I'm not too worried about this room. I feel pretty good about this room. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of rooms where, and in some schools, they're now starting in eighth grade or even third grade. So it's just something to think about. And, and this, since it's, it's your field, give some I, instruction. How, how do we do that? Let's see. Just Carol, you know what I'm um, well, just all over the world, I think people get trained. And uh, you know, we're working in about 100 countries. And people literally uh, learn about sources. What's Who do you trust? Uh, Fact-based. I mean, there's just a whole slew of ways you know, just as people in this room, there are a lot of experts in this room. I see people like Dr. Ralph over here and Lewis who have mastered their fields. And so I think all of us have to master the world of uh, media. It's hard to do in you know three minutes. I want everyone else here to talk, but thank you for asking. Yeah, thank you. Okay, why don't you pass it back to Joel? Joel, Joel Bremen in the back. Talk about masters. 
thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Gold the Scolder never seen one episode of Star Wars. Mainly because. Well, so I need I need to wake up. I went in Africa where we didn't. I'll get back to you. So, there's only one mic, and I want to say this. Literally, someone tells me this afternoon that after they heard the sermon, they went home and they found the episode on the on the internet and they watched it last night. I felt that was I was so honored. <laughs> No, no need to be. <laughs> Actually, today the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded. That uh, was for something different than I would do. I do want to address the point that you made about engaging in a specific activity in getting together. And I think the Star Wars episode pointed that out from your comments. Um, in looking at Steven Pinker's book very late last night, uh, page 64, <laughs> he has a list of under 10 scientific and medical advances that have uh, saved uh, literally tens of millions of lives mm -hmm. and uh, you know, increased the age uh, at, at birth to now in many countries pushing 90. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas 120 years ago, it was close to 50, even in this country. Yeah. One of those advances was the eradication of smallpox, mm -hmm. and, which occurred in 1980. Now, that event involved about uh, 50 different countries during the Cold War, where the Russians, the Eastern, other Eastern Europeans got together with the Western countries and had a specific objective. It wasn't just, uh, let's do something good in the halls of uh, Geneva or elsewhere, but they focused on a project. And I think that is the success. Uh, that's the reason, um, there's a great quote, that art and science can only exist in minute particulars. That uh, general good is the plea of the scoundrel the charlatan and the flatterer. So uh, I think we have to focus on what we do together, not just say, let's talk. Yeah, yeah thanks, man. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, people are being uh, very modest because the people who are speaking actually are <laughs> renowned experts in either of their field. Joel Bremen is a nationally prominent uh, public health uh, professional for his whole life, has worked all over the world, and uh, uh, Anthony's nationally known for his work in media so uh you're getting stuff from people who really know what they're talking about so thanks for those contributions yeah. uh i'm sam sherman i'm mark sherman and jen sherman's son uh, hey, hey, good to see you uh thank you so much for your sermon yesterday sid um i was really inspired it kind of brought up a couple things for me um two anecdotes one i i, I was a couple of years ago, uh, in the lead up to the 2020 election, I had attended a couple protest events downtown uh, in response to some of the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers showing up in DC. Um, and I remember there being, you know, uh, you know, some attempts to kind of quell some of the more violent tendencies at that circumstance, at that protest, uh, which were ultimately not met uh, and became quite violent. Um, and I ended up, you know, getting chased and ultimately was okay and ended up pretty unscathed, but I know some people who ended up with some pretty serious injuries uh, at that event. Uh, but then I also, so on one hand, I'm, I, I feel conflicted because there's like this, you know, there's this one, at, at that point when you're kind of, when you're on the battlefield, there's like two, you know, you're not gonna, peace is like not an option in some, in some cases. And that's like a difficult thing to accept and, and to be confronted with. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, I remember I used to date somebody who had uh, pretty conservative parents. Uh, and I remember us sitting down and having a conversation about some of these issues. And in that kind of interpersonal interaction, there was some understanding breached. Um, and again, it's like it's it's in the allowing, uh, not only like coming to the table with the hope of changing somebody, but also allowing yourself to be changed as well. 
is what I came with, you know, in that kind of, in those more violent atmospheres, you know, that's kind of where change is not possible. You know, the, the, the line is drawn in the sand. And at that, and when it gets to that point, it's important to stand up for what you believe in. But in the chan in moments where you can sit down with somebody, it's it's always worth it, in my opinion. Great, thank, thank you, you Ben. I'm gonna pass it back to Ralph, mind you. Ralph Mitchin. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking that our nervous system is hardwired <laughs> to pick up, to react to something that's different, unexpected. And then on top of that, we have a social media system that really incentivizes the spread of things that are, you know, unexpected. Out of, and it, it really makes it much easier to take something and just, you know, create something out of that and, and just get it to be to be spread. We've incentivized that power. And it really comes back to almost that the, the morality play that Star Trek episode you talked about. That we have this, this negative power building off of the way that, that it's gotten our nervous systems all reacting. And then we have this whole social media system that really just is built to really spread things. And you can get more hits if it's more outlandish. So, yeah. yeah. Good, David. And then we'll go to the other side of the room. Okay. I don't know that this is realistic and I don't know if it would be realistically spread far and wide enough but in election cycles we've all heard people talking about their plans to move to Costa Rica <laughs> or someplace else but it occurs to me um, following off of previous comments if we want to make a difference we need to think about how we can move to Kentucky Alabama <laughs> Kansas so that that interaction could actually take place. Naomi? I am Naomi Edelson, and I um, I work with Spruce. I just don't put Spruce in the room. It's John. All right. So um, I work for National Wildlife Federation, and your uh, talk last night was amazing to me because we're sort of in that. I feel like I'm in that uh, fight with my own organization, and it's not just social media. It's just how you message. The problems like there's always a scientific thing here's the problem and here's the solution right or any kind of equation right that you're trying to get people to take action and i've been uh arguing and uh or leading with saying you know we have hope for the future of and we list a species because of this particular bill like i'm working on the recovering america's wildlife act and i even got rabbi fred to do a video a short video on it so anyone else can help me if they want. But I think the point is what I'm running into is people feel like at, at my organization, which we reach many people, they're like, you have to tell them there's a problem to get them to click to their member of Congress. You have to tell them there's a dire problem. You have to do that, which is the doom and gloom. And there is a real problem with wildlife, right? There is a real crisis, but it's like, if you don't, but I feel like there's so much doom and gloom that if we can't leave with hope, then and success stories, then we're um, we're it, we're just getting people to have more despair, which is the, the point that was made. So I I just it is a real struggle and to turn a whole organization into think you know with with very very real problems like you know what I mean that just can't like just discount them. So it's like this a little bit of a balance. Yeah. But it does seem that there's real motivation, not just social media, but other ways of reaching people to, to getting them to take action. They say they know the numbers are always better when they talk about a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm over this side, let's get some hands over here. Let me just say, as I walk over here, and I'm going to stay in the, in the camera for a second. Um, there's so many examples about how uh, how how much more the public responds to fear uh, stimuli than hopeful stimuli. Uh, it's the reason why there's so much more negative campaign ads going than positive. Okay, it just gets people out. Um, I don't know why this example comes to my mind because they give a dozen examples, but for several elections. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu, who may yet again win prime minister again, believe it or not, he's back. Uh, that's all the polling I'm seeing. Every before every election, he would talk about uh, vote for me because all those guys are going to go to the end of the poll. He's talking about the Arab Israelis who are full fledged citizens of Israel, and he would get 
Jewish Israelis all worked up about the fact that the country was going to be overtaken by the preferences of Arab Israelis, God forbid, okay? And it works every, every time, you know? If you can make the danger seem palpable, people respond and come out in a way where the hopeful message is kind of like, okay, you know, I'm, that's not going to motivate me to get to the polls. So what is true in, in politics is true in almost every other realm of society, including advertising and the media, whatever else. So it is a phenomenon and uh, we need to kind of like work to kind of uh, change that equation because a world driven by fear is not a very pretty world to live in and probably mm -hmm. will become a very dangerous world to live in very quickly. That's a bunch of hands over here. So let's start with Stu, I'm gonna go to the back and over here to George. Okay. In uh, August, I was standing up with uh, Stu Simon, um, among other things about the climate stuff, Actually, on um, but in August, we were in the Balkans and visited Bosnia. Wow. Bosnia, you may know, is a plurality Muslim country. It's about 40 something percent of the population Muslim, the rest of the divide among many other groups. So, some groups even outside of Bosnia, they say, oh, Bosnians are radical because uh, they, they did get support from some radical militant Muslim elements. Uh, when they were fighting the independence war uh, were to try to stay free from Serbia, Yugoslavia, Serbia. Anyway, we were in Sarajevo. It was eye-opening to, to see Sarajevo in the evening, where you see everybody from full-length burkas to half to, to partially veiled to totally Western dressed, all walking, you know, in this very crowded area uh, for several hours in the evening. And it was every evening we were there for a few nights. This same country has as their prized possession, and they will write, they write it up in their book, it's their number one prized possession is the Sarajevo Haggadah, it's in their National Museum. Wow, okay. wow. Just, and just, just the point, I, when people say diversity, I mean, that was real diversity. You saw on the street, you saw in the museum, you saw, and, and, and people, and they were proud of their diversity. You know, they were proud of the diversity, but you know, they're of their pluralistic society. Yeah. Uh, that could be commercial, if you haven't read the book, People of the Book, written by Shirley yeah. Brooks. Uh, amazing the book is a story about the story of Hagadah. Yeah. Hi. Um, Introduce yourself. Your sermon, Introduce but, yourself. Oh, hi. I'm Tommy Giral. Um, and I'm a teacher of many years. And um, I missed your sermon, but. Uh, been listening, and um, the thing, you know, the, the echo chamber issue um, on social media is obviously what you're discussing, right? The echo chamber issue. Um, so, you know, I have some liberal students of mine. Um, they created a little play about the echo chambers. It was amazing. The audience who came were parents, and they were all clap, 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 and you know, so I feel like, oh, I'm doing something. They're doing something, <laughs> but actually, you know. The bigger problem, uh, obviously, is like the board meetings down in Florida and Texas and the book bannings in schools and yeah. don't say gay and all of that is just so enormous. And, and just that, you know, I kind of feel like, is there a way for, for me as an educator to get together with others and kind of come through the, the, the skylight and to all of these board meetings and somehow <laughs> have like a amazing connection with the, the mothers of freedom, you know, who are um, preaching about these books that are so evil, and, you know, gender, queer, whatever it is. And I just, I, I really don't know, but I'm, I'm, I don't know if social media, if there's like a way of using social media or something, I just feel very kind of small in this regard, but anyway. <laughs> Is actually that is that the name of the book called Mothers of Freedom? Is that yeah, their name? Yeah, yeah. Who are trying to ban books? Yeah, my students got the end of the play and they 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 did a lot of research and they um they embodied they were acting out the mothers of freedom on the stage. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it was really it was really intense. Yeah, I mean I I've been following the phenomenon, you know, with a lot of concern. I never heard the term mothers of freedom, which is so interesting because the, this goes back to the issue of language, right? Uh, you know, like Donald Trump was kicked off Twitter and he starts a media company called Truth Social, which by the way, 
you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> During the communist regime in the Soviet Union, the, the okay. national news service was called Pravda, which is a Russian word for truth. So, you know, the, the irony just drifts all over that those people who tell the big lie label the truth and then people get confused. Well, this is coming from Pravda, it must be true, right? George, I saw your hand, but you're gonna have to come a little closer for this mic to meet you, I think. Is that okay? Great to see you. Great sermon. Thank you. Best you ever gave. <laughs> <laughs> you a lot of good um, I just want to say this. First, Ile Wiesel, we Jews are prisoners of hope, he said. I am one of them. As you may know, I was a lawyer many years. And I love the law. And I expected that the courts would rescue us from what's going on because they would not sit still for some of the things that were being done. If you follow the Supreme Court, you will lose any hope. But I have noticed that when I get into the nitty gritty, and I see what some of the lower courts are doing. In fact, when presented with cases that should be thrown out, I'm amazed that they, not always by any means, but much more often than I would have imagined, they are. And the epitome of it, um, I suppose, was this case, this crazy case that Trump brought in uh, Florida, uh, wanting to have a special master and all this sort of thing uh, to, to blunt the attack of the Justice Department on him. That woman wrote a, and I, never mind that she's a woman, I'm perfectly happy with women judges. <laughs> but I couldn't believe that anybody would say what she did and ruled the way she did. And when that case got up to the Court of Appeals recently, she lost, they gave her a pasting, not the whole of it. The uh, Justice Department is very careful, but she lost the key point, namely that the investigation could continue with the classified documents that, that, uh, that they got. And, that, that was so, and then there's another case, the one with a special master, in which uh, the special master, came through and said, now, wait a minute. You abrogated the classification with your head and you didn't say anything. What evidence that you did that? And one of the questions, one of the things that's going up is there was no evidence that he ever did such a thing. And that may sift through. So I haven't given up hope. And since I haven't given up hope, <laughs> I wanted to share something hopeful because there's so much ground for pessimism. Thanks, George. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that court that overturned uh, the case Mar a Lago had two Trump appointed judges who ruled against Trump in that case. So, you know, you would have to hope. I actually, I'll go to Jimmy in a second. Uh, the other night, I actually uh, bumped into an old friend, colleague. Uh, some of you may know Nan Aaron. Anyone know that name? So, Nan Aaron for many years ran something called Alliance for Justice, which was the primary national nonprofit that looked into uh, judges and getting good judges on the courts from Court of Appeals, Appeals, Circuit Courts, so people or whatever else. So Nan tells me that when, when Obama left office, he left 60 vacancies on the table, yeah. like that it didn't fill. You know, it's just like she says the Democrats have never paid attention in the way the Republicans did to the importance of the courts. Yeah. McConnell, McConnell wouldn't. Uh, he, he wouldn't advance. It might not have been, but she just made it. Yeah. In fact, he said he was going to eliminate some of those judges, and then he added them after the term of the Yes, it's, it was complicated. Obama decided he didn't have the political capital to pull it off, so he didn't. But I mean, from her perspective, there are opportunities here about the courts, and we know that that's going. Uh, Jane. What? There was another very related um, point uh, as I was listening to you last night that I thought about in the scenario in that Star Trek uh, episode. 
which was that the people in power, who I forget who they were, the light, mm -hmm. the, the super- The alien force. The alien force. <laughs> not gonna start to force. <laughs> the, uh, the alien force um, was getting all their power from pitting the other two yeah. against each other. Right. And that is since, I mean, since, probably the beginning of the world, but since the beginning of our country, that's the way people have stayed in power. And we see it now where we see people, um, you know, voting for people that are not working in their best interests, uh, but they, because they're pitted against other people, they believe, um, they believe it is in their best interest. Yeah. I explained that very well. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but yeah, so, and I was really hearing that from, from that episode because when when the people realize that they have the same interests the superpower yeah yeah well, i think this is one of the things that came out in the 1619 project uh it probably was published before this but that's the first time i kind of saw how it was actually a strategy of uh, white elites in america essentially turned poor whites against blacks by saying you know these blacks were going to essentially uh take power away from you and so the inability to deliver for a large cross-section of white America was understood by the elites. And the only way they were to keep their, their votes is to make the new enemy people of color. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the long pieces of the, the tragic history of racism in this country. Come over here, back to this side. Bob. I'm Bob Singer, I'm a retired family doctor. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell a Facebook story. <laughs> um, but I connected with a friend of mine from high school. I grew up in uh, mid New Jersey and Monmouth County. My father worked at Fort Monmouth, and uh, our high school was regional. We had a lot of uh, soldiers' families there. And I grew up with a lot of uh, conservative uh, friends. And uh, I have a friend who's a, now a, uh, an evangelical Christian uh, pastor. And uh, during the last election, she started posting some really horrid stuff on Facebook. And um, I took a chance after several months of this to write to her. And, you know, we were, we were friends. And I said, you know, I, I really liked it better when you were posting about Christian love and charity and all that. And what you're posting right now is really quite terrifying to me as a Jew. And I was I was scared to do this but uh, she wrote back actually one day later and said i'm really glad you wrote i'm going to think about this mm -hmm. and then she started changing all her posts oh, wow. and about four months later she wrote back to me and said how am i doing oh, wow. and, uh, <laughs> reminds me of, uh, of a famous uh, study in family practice literature where they tried an intervention where family doctors would tell patients uh, who are smokers, uh, by the way, I want to remind you that smoking is really bad for you, and I recommend you quit. The entire intervention was saying that one sentence. And uh, it was a lot of people that were involved. And when they came up with the results, they found that 5% of the patients quit. 5%. And, you know, the first reaction is, well, it's not a big deal. But if you look at all the family doctors in the country, and you look at the total number of patients they take care of, and if people remember to have that one sentence on every visit uh, when they saw people, and 5% quit smoking, thousands, tens of thousands of lives across the country would be saved. And uh, in electoral politics, 5% can make the difference. So, uh, you know, the hope doesn't have to be that we have to change everybody's yeah. minds about everything but you know small percentage changes can um uh, can change the path of the future yeah and, and i would just say that there are many efforts right now afoot uh if you're interested in the election coming up in five weeks or so right uh whether it's canvassing door to door or doing stuff with phone calling or phone banking whatever else you know every organization out there is trying to get folks to make contact with voters in key states and key districts. So if you care about the future of the country, this is something that is really worth your time over the next five or six weeks. Let's go back to John. Susan. Good to see you. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Susan Stein. And uh, this conversation has brought to mind uh, a class that I took once on how to motivate mm -hmm. communities to take conservation actions. And uh, there was some study, this, I took this class a long time ago, but they, they mentioned some study that looked at, you know, what were the factors responsible behind people or what were the com common factors behind people that took conservation actions? And we were guessing with political party, income, whatever, all these, and no, no, no. The common factor was that they thought they could make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we talk about fear motivating people. Sure, I believe it. If people say, you know, that's what the research says, sure, fear motivates people. But I think it depends on what kind of action we're talking about. And if we're talking about, maybe it does motivate for people who are voting to vote for a certain candidate. But if we're talking about motivating someone to do something differently in the way they, you know, in a process or the way they lead their lives, put in solar panels, collect your glass, grass clippings, whatever, um, <clears throat> I think. It's nice to think that if you thought you could make a difference, you're more likely to do it. And I think the story that you told illustrates that. Uh, thank you. Hi, my, my name is Neil Mastin. Uh, I, I was thinking about your comment, George, uh, Rabbi George, um, about hope, because um, um, one of the things about your sermon that struck me as being very psychologically sophisticated, which you always are, um, is, is, uh, is our need to own our own dark side as well, as opposed to polarization of good and bad, but to, to notice that we all have our own um, in, inclinations for good and for bad. Um, one of the things that uh, when you said, George, that Ellie Wiesel talked about hope, I, I was thinking about um, a talk that I heard at a psychotherapy networker conference that Ellie Wiesel did, um, and one of the things he said, which was really powerful and striking to me, was the complexity that the Nazis both, um, that, that people survived because of hope in the, in the Holocaust and the, in the concentration camps, but at the same time that the Nazis used hope against the Jews by putting on the, you know, the entrance to the concentration camp, work will set you free, and to give them hope that if they went along with the Nazi agenda, that they would survive, which was bullshit, you know, so that he was saying that hope is a very complex mixture, that, that hope can be um, enlivening and, and save your life, and hope can also be used against you at the same time by, you know, evil people. Um, and I, I, I think the only answer that I come up with when I think about that dilemma is what you said about we need to look at our own um, complexity, and that consciousness of complexity is the only thing that will save us, is that to, to realize that we have both good and bad in us. It's not just a matter of the bad is out there and the good is in here, but that we all have to struggle with our unconscious mixture of, of complexity and, and complicated things. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Oh, Laura, I wasn't sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah. with math, it gets harder. <laughs> Laura, introduce yourself, Laura. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Laura Epstein. I'm James' daughter. Um, oh, this kind of ties together a few different pieces, but one thing that stuck out to me in your sermon was that you need to use the time. If you're going to take time away from social media or from your echo chamber, you have to use that time to do something. And I think that in some of the conversations we're having here, there can be a lot of hopelessness of what can we do to change the minds of people in, you know, Kentucky or Kansas. But I think that, you know, we live here in, I'm in DC, somewhere in Maryland or Virginia. And I think that especially in the DC metro area where we can be so focused on national politics, which is also my job and what I do, um, we can ignore some of the inequities and problems that are happening at a hyper-local level. And so I think when we're thinking about, you know, what are the news sources we're looking at? Are we looking at the really hyper-local stories about a housing issue that's happening in our community that we can actually make a real difference and we can have that hope to actually have an impact. Are we working to, you know, make our workforces, our individual workforce more diverse? I think there's a lot of different work that we all can do, even if we're not, you know, going out and living in Kentucky or somewhere else. Yeah. And Laura, tell everyone what you're doing right now. Uh, I work for, uh, I work on the Hill. Yeah. Um, for? Uh, for Senator Maggie Hassan. 
Uh, she's from New Hampshire. Great. Okay. Cool. I just want to do a shout out. It's so great to see kid, young people who grew up in a Dutch home as little children, you know, baby nannies here, the name is here, whatever else. We're now like adults doing important things in the world, you know, Sam and uh, Laura and their others too. So it's just great. And I will always privilege them when they put their hands up. So, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> if you're not in your 20s, but Marty, you're, you look young. Go ahead. I'll give, I'll give you a break here. <laughs> So first of all, I don't know your name. Yeah, Mark, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Marty Shore. I'm Naomi Edelson's husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, has anybody watched the Holocaust series? Yes. Yeah. 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 So what you were just saying. Um, the last line of uh, Anne Frank's diary uh, was, I still believe in the goodness of the people. And, um, you know, she suffered unbelievably and still had this hope. And, um, and if you look at Germany now, uh, Germany is, I think, the most open country towards Jews in all of Europe. Um, I'm not wrong about that, but I know they started a synagogue in Germany, a beautiful synagogue. The other thing I want to say is I want to thank Jamie for the class that she led about Blacks and Jews. And that uh, influenced me to do something in my neighborhood about that as well. Yeah, a lot of great work going on from this community and through this community. Uh, I'll share a quick anecdote. Uh, yesterday morning, always the day of Colindra is always a weird day for me. Like, I'm never quite sure. Like, I don't feel like doing work. But it's not a holiday yet. But a big one's coming up. I usually speak on Community Night. It's kind of like whatever. So I, no, it's just it's hard for me to like find my place, you know. And and my mind's going in a thousand directions. But I got an email yesterday, uh, and they're this afternoon we're going to do a thing on Haiti. But there are some Haiti veterans here, including Marty and others. Um, where are my Haiti people? Raise your hands. You've been with me to Haiti, right? So we've got a dozen Haiti travelers here. So for those who don't know, a quick story. Well, you've heard a lot about Pastor Johnny, who runs the NSL school. The other main person who's been our contact in Haiti is Johnny June, J-E-U-N-E, -E, whose parents started an incredible project called Grace International. It's a ministry that started very small and now is all throughout Haiti in Southern Florida. And they run orphanages for kids, and they run a gigantic soup kitchen. We've worked there on every visit, whatever else. I got this most amazing email. I'm going to get choked up in a second. <sighs> From John Jim's father, the bishop, who I've had the privilege of meeting and sitting and talking with. And his wife was even more amazing than he, uh, who single handedly built this orphanage and gathered kids, orphans from all over Haiti to this compound where they have a school and food and education the whole day. And they said, given what's happened in this country the past couple of years, uh, there's no government, there's no police, the country's being run by gangs. The cost of everything has quadrupled, and we cannot afford to feed our kids in the orphanage. Uh, within the next month, we're probably going to close down the Lord's mm -hmm. Table, which is their name for their soup kitchen, which we've prepared meals there. And I remember the first meal we prepared there. Did we do that singing together, or was that the year after you were there? The first year we were there, where we spent the morning preparing food, and it was that temporary camp of people who still didn't have homes because of the earthquake. And they were living in huts and cardboard and plywood houses. And when they opened the doors, there were literally hundreds of people in line bringing pails and buckets to pick up food for their entire families. It was an unbelievable sight. I'll never forget it. So the notion that they soon can't uh, feed their kids and do the Lord's table was just crushing to me. So I said to Sandy, we're, we're going to make a gift. Uh, 
but the email was so damn positive, I couldn't believe it. I mean, in other words, as I read it, it it's all about how much we enjoy God's blessings and how fortunate we are, and we, we're doing God's work and whatever else. And then there's this appeal, which is horrific. And then it ends by saying, you know, we're sure that God will place, you know, in your hearts the ability to do the right thing. And it, it was, I was so inspired by that approach because, again, I, the last line of my sermon close to the end, I said, that our ancestors face things far more horrific than anything we're facing today, for sure. And yet they found a way to move forward. And I would, go beyond that to say in Haiti, the situation is even far worse than what our ancestors might have faced, right? So how you go forward with that kind of hope, and we saw that every time we went to Haiti and went to worship, and we saw how deep the faith runs, the more desperate the situation gets. I mean, that's the role that religion has played. Now, I know we can go do a thing about all the bad things that religion has done in the world and throughout history. But in the end, when you go to communities, that have so little to live for. And all they are hungry for is a little bit of faith and hope. You realize the role that religion plays in poor countries all around the world. So just wanted to share that. There's so many new hands here, so you don't mind. I'm not gonna call you again. Uh, Charlie and Lewis and then Bob. And that's gonna be out of time. I'm Charlie I'm sorry to call on you again, but I want to come back to Brave Angels. <laughs> you talked about that effort being a failure, and I'm not so sure. I actually participated in a couple of their workshops. You, they do a very good job of bringing reds and blues, conservatives and liberals together. And it is a very humanizing thing. You get to see each other as people that care, We're irrespective of positions on the issues. And it's, it's great. It's, it's just great. On the other hand, for political change, it's completely useless. It's good to go to participate in those kinds of things. It's good to do outreach. It's good to meet people, those people, the other. It's good to spend time in their presence and their presence. And then come back and canvass and get out the vote for the candidates you care about. Because you're not going to win elections that way. The only way you're going to win elections is the hard way. Get out and do the work. Thanks, Charlie. Right next to uh, Louis and Mom, I, I enjoyed the summer. The one of the pieces you said in the middle that about the guy quoting some guy from I think the 19th century, where what you have in your heart is what you see in the world. Um, I, I that was flip it the other way around. It's important. It's important to get this right. So the the, the line from the piece of Musar was uh, the amount of chesed you see in the world. Is the amount of chesed that you embody? Okay, and, and and it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. It says like what you see, and that's why I use that. that let me just, because then I'm going to hear. I'll get back to the second list. So I just want to make sure that the point comes. Uh, the point is important. I'll just repeat for folks online. Uh, Lewis was quoting the piece from Musar from uh, Rabbi Chaim Friedlander, and the line that I mentioned several times in the sermon is the amount of chesed loving kindness that you see in the world corresponds to the amount of chesed that you will embody. Right? Embody means like you take it in and it's coming back out from you, okay? And it's counterintuitive. You would think it's the other way around, okay? So and that's why I, the reason I use the verse is to say, let's think about what we're taking in, all the inputs that are coming into what we're seeing and hearing are all the wrong inputs, which is why it's hard for us to put out goodness into the world because we're intaking so much conflict and hatred and uh, and bias in the world. That was my point. So now you make your point. Sorry. Well, no, my, my, my point was that I heard it put out of the way. <laughs> but when I thought of was that, you know, the orange one who should be nameless, he has badness in him and he sees it in the world and and adds more to it, creates more yeah, to it. Right. So that I feel like it's important what I thought you were going to say, and then you didn't get there, and now I understand why, was that it's important to work on our goodness so that we can spread more of it out yeah. from us. And then I just wanted to say about Sam's comment that I remember the days when we had nonviolent training, right? So that we would go and not respond 
even though it seems silly. Right. Um, and that maybe we need those trainings again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Louis. Pass it down to Bob, and then I think we'll be out of time. I'm just trying to close it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, Bob um, this we've we've talked about this before. Uh, the book Bowling Alone, and the whole idea that there used to be societal um, uh, conventions where people, regardless of their status or their political, would go out and do things together. Um, and that to me is, is really what has broken down. I mean, the, the reason people go to Facebook is because they're not communicating with other people in a social setting. Um, and, and I think that part of why Dot Shalom means so much to us because we can come together. And um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, this is probably beyond us, but I think it, if this society is going to survive, and it really is a matter of survival, I mean, it's so separate. Um, people are going to have to get out of their silos and interact, and you can't do it on uh, just through social media. It, that's that's transitional, transcendental, meaningless. I mean, you really have to interact, and it, and it's not just forced meetings where people talk, come and which are fine, where people come and talk about themselves. So people have to get out and. Um, and, and like a workplace used to be that way. And even that today is becoming much more um, isolated. So I said we're going to end it, but I'm not only a rabbi, I'm also a father, and my daughter's here from Israel. And she, she waved me and goes, I have a comment, Dad. So I got to give her the mic. Okay. Should we take a vote? Is that okay? Okay. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'm Jenny. And actually, the person sitting next to me, when you invited the youngins uh, uh, in, in the room to speak, said, why don't you speak? I said, well, actually, I live in Israel. I feel quite, quite disconnected from conversations happening in America these days because I observe it from afar, but I'm not living it. Um, I left America, the U.S., seven years ago, and for um, over five years, I've been living in Israel. So I want to leave you with a little notes from the field of Israel, um, which is these conversations don't exist in Israel. Really? No, not at all. And, and I feel it's, it's like I live in two worlds by being able to understand these kind of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, class, race mm -hmm. conversations. But I don't engage in those conversations whatsoever in Israel because they're almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give a few examples and, and kind of um, one is I'm, I'm about to organize a lead at the end of this month, a retreat for um, on, uh, coordinated with Moisha House, which is an American NGO. And uh, we're doing something on gender. Um, and they said to me, I said, it's going to be even amount, try to be even amount men and women. And they said, well, aren't you thinking about transgender or um, those who are, you know, LGBT? And I said, I said, it's not a conversation here. I said, if I say, if I make a plug, it's like there's nobody in our immediate sphere who are representing that, not to dismiss it, but just to, I gave feedback back that it wasn't relevant in our context. Basically, nobody's talking about it. Um, and then when you talk about broader issues, you have Israeli Arab issues on, um, you know, Israelis are very Israeli, right? And my dad gave the example of, of, um, of the election politics and absolutely fear. But what I also find in, in, is that it's easy for us here to sit and look at people who live in the West Bank as settlers, as, as to vindicate them as they're the bad guys, they're, they're perpetuating the problem. But I've been to the settlements many times. My closest friends are actually grew up there and are very proud Zionists, fighting in, 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 you know, still serve in um, reserve duty on the regular to do military operations in the West Bank. And so I hear reports from the field from that side. And, and it's just not that, right? Those are not the people that we see in the media or we hear about it. It's so much more complex and the layers in, in which to break it down. And so I, th I think I was like, what's, what's my conclusion? I think one is that the status quo is very, very strong there um, and, and likely here too. So how do you break status quo of, of norms, social norms in many ways, but also that, that what, what's been the biggest takeaway of the, as many years as I've lived in Israel has been, um, I'm still there because I fell in love with how complex the place is, <laughs> right? And it's a transformation from hating it to being like intrigued by it and saying, how can I love folks who live in the settlements because they're motivated by ideology and something that they care about and because they actually find stronger sense of community, which is something we all can relate to, 
kind of stronger sense of community by living in the settlements. They're not there because they want to perpetuate the Israeli Arab mission. Mm -hmm. And so we have to live with that dissonance that things don't always make sense according to categorical ways. Um, and those are some of my notes from the field of Israel. So thanks for your listen. Adam, Adam, Adam. Thanks, Ben. Uh, we're over time. I, I just always, every year, I look forward to this exchange wow. because this is really like adoption community at its best. I mean, mm -hmm. wrestling with tough ideas, big ideas, ideas that can make us better, can make our society better, and we do it in community. So thank you for coming out. Wishing everyone a Shana Tova, a healthy and happy new year. All right, so. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.